China is really ramping up its technology development. And there are four key areas where I would say the competition between China and the U.S. is joined. One, of course, is semiconductors, the chips that are in your computers, phones, tablets, everything. It's the basic technology that underlies everything else we do in computing. The Chinese have spent hundreds of billions of dollars trying to catch up with where the West is, and they're beginning to do so. Two is artificial intelligence. This is really a baseline technology that underlies so much of everything else that's happening. And while the best academics in that space are still in the U.S., the application of AI and certain specific parts of AI, such as drone technology and visual recognition AI, are really, really very advanced in China. So I would say in some of those, they're really neck and neck with us. Number three, of course, has gotten the most attention, and that's 5G and 6G technology. It's going to run everything from your mobile phones to the Internet of Things. So the backbone infrastructure of that is critical. Huawei, of course, is neck and neck with Ericsson and Nokia, the other big competitors, and the Chinese are doing quite well. And finally, and this is one that people don't talk about very much, fintech. You know, the Chinese fintech giants, especially Alipay and Financial, WeChat Pay, are incredibly impressive. And especially in the international payment space, are much better than anything you see out there in the West. And if we don't watch it carefully, I think this is an area we're going we're gonna to wake up in a couple of years and it'll be a 5G moment where we'll say, oh my gosh, all of a sudden we're behind. Those are the four big ones I would mention. Of course, there are others, certain aspects of biotechnology, if they bleed into bioweapons in particular, quantum computing, which is further out there. But the Chinese are catching up in all sorts of technical areas. In some cases, that's appropriate. In others, we'll certainly want to stay on our toes. China really has a whole of society approach to all of these technologies. So it's from specific subsidies for companies working in the technologies I mentioned to promoting education. You know, the number of AI programs in China is proliferating far faster than it is in the West to on the military side, a concept they call civ mill fusion where you have the private sector and the public sector really working hand in hand to promote and develop those technologies. And then finally, to spread them internationally, uh, and this you saw particularly with Huawei, there are subsidies and zero interest loans to help disseminate Chinese technology internationally. I think the Trump administration deserves some credit here for raising the alarm at how quickly China is catching up in these key technologies. However, what the Trump administration did was almost entirely defensive. So we tightened our investment screening, making it harder for Chinese companies to invest in our most advanced technology. We put in place very, very tough new export controls, making it harder for American technology to go to China. All of those were necessary, but in some cases it was overreach. It wasn't multilateral. For example, in semiconductors, which we talked about in the previous question, we put these tough new export controls in place, but we didn't ask our allies to do the same thing. So of course the Chinese just buy them from Korea, Japan, the Netherlands, elsewhere. They don't need to get them from us. So that's one example. And I think now, what we should be doing is instead of trying to tear China down, we should be doing more to build ourselves up, to build up the U.S. innovation ecosystem. There's a lot we can be doing to build ourselves up, and we're starting to. And the nice thing is this is one of the few issues in Washington that seem to be fairly bipartisan. So there are a couple of big initiatives out there. One is the Endless Frontier Act pushed by Chuck Schumer, which is going to pump as much as $100 billion over, I think, about 10 years into advanced research and development for some of these key technologies that I talked about. That'll be important. Of course, it'll be important then to spend that money well 
and to use it to leverage more private sector investment so it isn't just wasted, but that's one. Two, the new infrastructure bill, part of the American Jobs Plan, there is a promise for $50 billion to push advanced semiconductor manufacturing. This is really critical. However, semiconductors have so much capital spend that $50 billion, even if the U.S. spends it, and that's a huge amount of money, that is only about four months or so of capital investment by that industry. So once again, just like the Endless Frontier Act, we need to make sure that we can spend that money effectively on the most advanced chip design and manufacturing, and that we use it to leverage appropriately private sector incentives. So we're not just giving that money away and it flows down the drain. Intertwined is exactly the right word. So while many of the most advanced chips are designed in the United States and much of the equipment, the machines that produce semiconductors <laughs> um, come from the United States, our company's biggest customer by far is China. And Chinese chips, a lot of those are actually assembled in China <laughs> into all of the phones and tablets that are currently in all of our pockets. So chips are designed in the United States, often manufactured in Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, then shipped to China and assembled into all of the products that then get shipped all over the world through Foxconn, for Apple, for Samsung, for everyone else. So you are absolutely right to say that this is one international ecosystem. Just breaking it up entirely doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What I do think makes sense, and people are beginning to talk about it in a bipartisan way, is to have very narrowly tailored export controls on the most advanced equipment that would allow the Chinese to make the most advanced chips, especially that goes into military applications. That's one. And to do that, as I said, in answer to a previous question, multilaterally, it can't just be the US. It has to be the same controls on, especially in this space, Japanese, Korean, Dutch, and American technology, because those four countries are currently ahead on that. And then finally, on a lot of other second and third generation stuff to keep cooperating, because it is a good market for all of us, and we shouldn't be 100% decoupled. Onshoring the production of semiconductor chips, meaning putting the fabs, these huge factories that cost five, 10, sometimes more than that billion dollars a piece to build, I think is appropriate in small select areas. The most advanced new chips and those that are going into our national security, defense and intelligence supply chain. I think anything more than that is gonna be folly because let's start with, we don't even have a workforce right now that is specially trained to work in those giant fabs. Most of those experts are in Taiwan, Korea, Japan. So there would be a huge shortage, something like 200,000 people if you start onshoring fabs. Yeah, you can grow that workforce and that would be a positive thing, but you don't need it. What you want is by and large to keep the international trade system in these products going, but the most advanced important things and those that go into national security, yes, some of those we should be manufacturing here. Yeah, you're seeing a lot of tit for tat here. So from an American perspective, the Chinese started it, if you will, <laughs> by pushing so hard into some of these technologies and as opposed to letting it be an equal playing field and may the best technology win, really pushing in a way that we discussed earlier to make sure they're in the lead on 5G, semiconductors, et cetera. We've talked a lot about the US response. What's China doing now? doubling down on their strategy. You're talking about dual circulation where there was gonna be one internal market for things. They're moving very rapidly to cut, for example, 
non-Chinese software out of any systems in China, especially those that touch the government or state-owned enterprises called the 253 program. That's almost done and implemented. And there's a lot of push to be more nationalistic. So I'm always surprised when I go to China how strenuously patriotic and nationalistic the young generation is. They really are very pro Xi Jinping and they're going into Chinese tech companies and they see it as their patriotic duty in some cases to make sure that China remains the tech leader in these things. So this is important. And I just want to emphasize one more thing. Competition is healthy and we should welcome it. Total decoupling is in no one's interest. So I think it behooves both countries to narrowly bound what you were going to compete in and also define some areas where we can continue to cooperate. And I think that is still lacking a little bit. I'm hopeful in two ways. One, if we can narrowly bound our competition and say, okay, it's really just in these few technologies where both sides think they need to be in the lead, that's a positive thing. And there's so many other areas where we can cooperate. For example, clean technologies, solar, um, carbon capture and storage, some many, many parts of artificial intelligence, many parts of biology and biotech. There are so many areas where we should be cooperating and we shouldn't underestimate how much basic science research happens and the best basic science research really happens when you have international teams, often involving American and Chinese researchers. So we should be celebrating that rather than undermining it while being careful about the things that impact our national security. So hopefully one, we can find areas where we can still continue to cooperate. Even if we can't do that, and it's looking pretty dark, pretty bleak these days in the US-China relationship on both sides. I think if we can't do that, this can really spur a new era of vast advances in science and technology, kind of like the space age in the 60s and 70s. And that's a positive thing. Healthy competition that spurs both of us and all of our friends and allies to be better at what we're doing can only help the progress of humanity.